Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vector from UC San Diego. Today, I'm going to talk about our work reading the tea leaves, a comparative analysis of threat intelligence. This is a joint work from multiple institutions. So what is threat intelligence? It is the knowledge that allows organizations to understand and mitigate cyber attacks. And this knowledge involves a broad set of things. It can be malware or vulnerability report. It can be some IP or DNS blacklist where we can directly use them to block traffic. Or it can be some underground forum thread where we can see what the bad guys are discussing. All those knowledge can help security experts to better understand the threat and therefore defend against it. Among this broad set of threat intelligence formats, one of the most common formats is what we call indicator of compromise. These are the forensic data that identify malicious activities in a system or network. And these are the data that are directly actionable. They can be IP addresses of malicious actors or compromised hosts, firewall hashes that identify malicious malwares, or domain names or URLs of a malware command control server or some fish sites. And we can directly use this data to, let's say, block malicious traffic or identify malicious files on our system. And this data is usually delivered in a form of a data feed where the consumer subscribe to a feed and the threat intelligence provider regularly update the feed. And some of the commercial threat intelligence provider will charge fees for providing such service. And this is a thriving industry. The global, market, uh, the global threat intelligence market size was estimated about $3 billion in 2016. And this number will go beyond $13 billion in 2025 based on market prediction. And here I give some example of the commercial threat intelligence providers. But beyond the commercial threat intelligence provider, there are also many, many public data sources managed by individuals or organizations, which we can access the data for free. Now with so many data sources floating around, assume we are a person in charge of protecting our company's network. There's an immediate question. Which product should we choose? We need an object way to evaluate the quality of threat intelligence products so we can do reasonable comparison. More specifically, we need a set of metrics for feed comparison and the techniques for calculating these metrics. However, there isn't such a standard in the community, and this is what our work try to address. We define six basic threat intelligence metrics for feed evaluation, and we demonstrate the techniques to calculate these metrics. And we further collect a broad set of threat intelligence data and analyze 47 IP feeds and eight malware hash feeds using these metrics. And we try to answer the question, can we make a reasonable decision about which product should we choose? Our data collection include both commercial threat intelligence data and public threat intelligence data. Our commercial data comes from three sources. Facebook Threat Exchange, a paid IP reputation service, and a paid feed aggregator. Here we anonymize the last two due to our agreement with the provider. And our data collection period starts from December 1st, 2017 to July 20th, 2018. And we collect all of the data hourly. And for the IP data, we further categorize the data into different category based on information provided by the feed themselves and conduct analysis within each category. Here we need to do this categorization because different IP have different meanings. If we just collect a bunch of feeds and start comparing each other, we might end up comparing apple to orange. So we want to do a fair comparison and that's why we have this categorization stage. And for the following experiment, we focus on the six most popular We focus on the six most popular category in our data set. 
they are scanners, brute force IPs that have conduct brute force logging attempts, malware IPs that serve as malware command control server, botnet hosts belong to a botnet, exploit the hosts that have conduct remote vulnerability exploit, and spam IPs that involve in sending spam emails. And now we present our six metrics. They are volume, which measure the size of a feed. Differential contribution, which measures the additional data one feed can provide over another feed. Exclusive contribution, which measures the exclusive data one feed can provide among a group of feeds. Latency measures how fast a feed can report threat. And accuracy measures the false positive rate of each feed. And finally, coverage matter how well a feed covers the intended threat. So among these six metrics, the first three are quantitative metrics. They doesn't involve the meaning of the indicators, so they are easy to calculate. But the last three are qualitative metrics. And because it's very hard for us to get the ground truth of the underlying threat, it is very difficult to comprehensively evaluate this qualitative metrics. So we need some external data to help us estimate these metrics. And in the following of this talk, we're gonna demonstrate some of these techniques. And uh, more specifically, we're gonna talk about our experiment and results under these three metrics. And we will only talk about the experiment we did on the IP feeds. So first, differential contribution. Differential contribution of one feed with respect to another is the indicators that the first feed have, has that the second feed doesn't have. It measures the additional value one feed can add on top of another. And we usually quantify this by calculating the complement, which is the intersection between two feeds. And we define the intersection rate as the overlap of two feeds divided by the size of the first feed. And this diagram shows the pairwise intersection rate of all our 47 IP feeds. Each cell represents an intersection rate between two feeds. The darker the cell is, the higher the intersection rate is. The cells that are marked as red are the comparison between feeds within a category. And the ones that are in blue are the ones that for the two feeds from two different categories. And if we look at the diagram, we can see that the feeds in scan and brute force category have good amount of pairwise intersection, which is pretty good. But still, about three quarter of their pairwise comparison have an intersection rate less than 15%. And for all the other four categories, they all have over three quarter of their pairwise comparison with an intersection rate less than 1%. This means most of the feed are collecting different stuff. And that brings us a problem. If all these feed are collecting different indicators, then which one should we choose? Should we just get them all? But how do we know that's enough? But still remember, this is a still an easy case. We haven't considered the legitimacy of these indicators yet. And that is what we're gonna talk about next accuracy, which estimate the rate of false positives in each feed. False positives are the data that should not belong to a feed based on its definition. And it is very difficult to comprehensively calculate false positives without ground truth data. So what we did is we took a conservative approach. We calculate a white list of IPs that either should not be included in a feed or if included, would cause significant disruption. And we check how much of our IPs in our feeds overlapped with our whitelist. Our whitelist IPs come from three different sources. The first is unroutable IPs, where we use the IPs that were BGP unroutable when they first appeared in a feed. And we get the daily BGP routable data from the raw view project. The second source is the Alexa top domains, where we check whether the IP in our feeds 
actually belong to Alexa top domains. And since Alexa top list can churn over time, we only use the domains that are in the Alexa top 25K for the entire eight month of our experiment period. The last source are the popular CDN networks, where we check whether the IPs in our feeds fall into the IP range of the five popular CDN networks. And for the unrollable data, in most cases, they should not appear in a feed. And the, for the second two source, if they appear in a feed, they will cause disruption because they might hurt legitimate traffic. And we compare all our scan feeds with three different uh, wireless sources. And here we give six examples of this result. The first column is the feed name. The second column is the percentage of IPs in a feed that are unroutable. The third column is the number of IPs in a feed that are, belongs to uh, top Alexa domains. And the last column is the number of IPs in each feed belongs to the CDN networks. In general, among 47 feeds, 33 feeds have at least one unroutable data. And the 13 feeds have over 1% of their address being unroutable. And we further found that 12 feeds have at least one reserved IPs, the IPs that should only be used in private network. And in some cases, feeds can have over hundreds of such reserved IPs. And for the other two source, 21 feeds have IPs from top Alexa domains. And we have seen some cases where feeds have IPs of github.com, uh, dropbox.com, or bing.com. And 14 feeds have IPs from popular CDN networks. And as we can see from the example, some feeds can have over 1,000 of IPs belong to CDN networks. This implies that potential false positives in the feeds are relatively common. And we have to keep that in mind when we use this threat intelligence data. The last metrics we're going to talk about the coverage, which measure how well a feed covers the intended threat. A perfect coverage will mean it will cover all the indicators that belong to a threat category. But as you can imagine, that's unrealistic for us to get ground truth for all the threat activities on the internet. So we need some external data to help us estimate the coverage. And in our experiments, we use the scanners collected from the telescope to estimate the coverage of our scan feeds. We use UCSD Internet Telescope, which is a monitoring a slash A network, and we collect three months of data from the telescope. And we further use the Bro IDS default configuration to detect scanners. Note here that the telescope doesn't carry any legitimate traffic. So for scanners that have scanned many telescope IPs, they are highly likely indiscriminately scanning the IP space. So we're using the scanner we collected from the telescope as the base and check how well our scan feeds cover the scanners from the telescope. And in total, we collect over 20 million scanners from the telescope in three months. So this diagram shows the coverage of each scan feed on different sizes of scanners. Here, scanner size means the number of telescope IPs the scanner have scanned within a day. So 10,000 IPs, uh, scanner size 10,000 will mean the scanner have scanned at least 10,000 telescope IPs within a day. And we can see from the graph, the d shell IP feed outperform all the other feeds in the coverage metrics, which is pretty good. However, if we look at the big picture, the union of all scan feeds add together only cover less than 2% of the telescope scanners. And even if we only look at the big scanners, the scanner with size over than 10,000, we still have overall coverage around 10%. This implies that having a large list of threat intelligence feed doesn't necessarily guarantee a good coverage. So now we took a step back. We, we conduct our analysis on the threat intelligence product and we observe low intersection and low coverage. 
This could be because several non-exclusive reasons. It can be that the underlying space of indicators is just so large, so each feed can only sample a small fraction of it. It can also be because different uh, collection methodology, even for the same cate uh, thread category, end up select a different sub-distribution. It's also possible that not all the thread are experienced uniformly uh, across the internet. So different people on a different part of the internet will observe different threads. And we think the future research work should look more on what's actually going on for the underlying threat landscape. And by analyzing the data, we also realized that blindly using threat intelligence data is unlikely to provide good coverage and is also prone to collateral damage caused by false positives. We think each organization should fine tune the data for specific use cases when they're using threat intelligence data. And the future research should explore more ways to use threat intelligence data other than just use it simply for the uh, network defense. And that's all of this talk. And we only cover a tiny amount of the result we get from this experiment. And for the whole result, please welcome to check our paper. And uh, thank you very much. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. Hello, uh, my name is Bobo, I'm from Facebook. Thanks, this was super interesting work. I may have missed this uh, while I was trying to take notes, but uh, did you look at the impact of deletions or removals? Uh, do feeds regularly prune uh, what they are putting out because their estimate of the maliciousness of that IP has changed or they've acknowledged it's a false positive? How do you deal with that? Yeah, we, we handle that. That was actually under our volume metrics, which I didn't talk in the talk. So we check how the different feeds handle this expiration. expiration. And the different feeds handle this differently. Some feeds will give a straight three months window. So all the data will delete from the feed after three months. And some feeds will use a variance uh, expiration window, which we don't know how they decide, but we observe different uh, value window for the indicators. And there are even some other feeds which don't do this at all. They just tell you, this is the malicious IP we found last week. And it's up to you to decide when you need to expire your data. And so how did you control for the false positive rates when you were finding that with these different expiration policies? Yes, so we only look at the data that shows up first time. Yeah, so we handle that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, nice talk. Um, my name is Shivram from USC. Um, I have a question with respect to your ground truth evaluation and false positive estimates with Alexa. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, like, uh, don't you think that there might be some cases where there are actual malicious uh, websites which get into the Alexa top 25K and they're getting listed in the blacklist? So did you observe any? Yes. I mean, it's possible that they are actually malicious. And um, it's hard for us to argue, like, is this comprehensive enough? So that's why. What we did here is we used the domains that are stay in the Alexa top list across the entire A month to ensure that this is indeed a popular site. So even if this is a malicious site, they are definitely popular sites. And that's how we minimize the potential uh, falls caused by this experiment. Yeah, hi. Uh, great, great talk and very relevant. Uh, Asaf Sedon from Columbia University. So just to follow up on that question, so um, we've all also often see, seen attacks where people embed, let's say, malware on a file sharing site like uh, Dropbox or the many other yeah. competitors which, which are going to be in the 25K, or they take over, you know, they compromise a specific page in an otherwise legitimate website. So how do you control for that? Yeah, so that's why we say this is like collateral damage. This will cause collateral damage. Yes, those file sharing, like CDN networks, kind of thing can be, be abused with malicious. But if you just blindly use the IPs to block traffic, you might block legitimate traffic. So in this case, 
you cannot just look at the IPs. You need more information to fine tune your data. And that's what, why we said in the end, we need to fine tune for specific use cases. All right, let's thank Vector one more time.